Good day, everybody. Welcome to the talk on the incident of, in the Kyle of Tongue, which took place in March 1746. Uh, this is one of the series of the 45 in 45 minutes, uh, which are given by uh, members of the 1745 Association. I'm going to begin by uh, just a brief overview of the Kyle itself, where it is, uh, and then a little bit about the incident itself before we go into greater detail. The Kyle of Tongue is a sea lock on the very north coast of Scotland, and Tongue is a small village on the eastern side of the Kyle. And in uh, March 1746, a Jacobite ship was chased into the Kyle by a British warship uh, and destroyed or captured. The Jacobite ship was carrying men and munitions um, and uh, gold destined for the army of Prince Charles Edward Stuart. The whole lot was captured. The ship was very badly damaged and then captured as well. Um, and therefore the munitions and the gold never reached the army of Prince Charles for which it was in initially intended. And I suppose it's arguable that um, the Battle of Culloden might have gone a little bit differently. The outcome may have been different um, had this money and the armaments reached Prince Charles prior to the battle. Difficult to be sure, of course, and perhaps we'll discuss that a little more later in the talk. So let's just have a little look and see where the Kyle of Tongue is. Here we have a map of the northeast corner of Scotland, John O'Groats there, and to the north, the Orkney Islands. If we travel westwards along the coast to the blue turquoise arrow, that's pointing directly at the Kyle of Tongue. And you can see a little village of Tongue in the, on the eastern side of the Kyle. On that hotel, on the outer wall of the Craggan Hotel in Melness, is this very fine bronze plaque. You can see it's got uh, the six petal Jacobite rose in the, at the top of the plaque, and at the bottom it says, erected by the 1745 Association in 2019. And the legend on the plaque more or less sums up the incident and the content of this talk. I'll read it with you. It says, on the 25th of March, 1746, the French sloop Le Prince Charles, formerly HMS Hazard, was forced aground by a British warship on the nearby headland of Ard Skinned. The officers got ashore but were captured, along with a consignment of gold destined to support the army of Prince Charles Edward Stuart. The starving Jacobites were defeated at Culloden on the 16th of April, 1746. So to understand why this incident happened and its consequences, I think we, we possibly have to go back a little way in time. So we're gonna go back to October, 1745, um, just a month or so after the Jacobite rising uh, began. In October, 1745, Prince Charles and his army were doing pretty well. Uh, they raised the standard at Glenfinnan, of course, um, gathered together a couple of thousand troops and marched on Edinburgh, which they occupied without any difficulty. They won the Battle of Preston Pans, just outside Edinburgh, and recruitment to the army camp at Duddingston was going well, and Prince Charles himself was occupying the palace of Holyrood House. Things couldn't have been any better at the time. Meanwhile, in the North Sea, the French, were doing what they could to supply the Jacobites with men and money and arms. And between the 9th and 19th of October, several consignments were landed at the Jacobite strongholds of Montrose and Stonehaven. These ports were usually blockaded by the Royal Navy, um, but the weather being as it is and sailing ships being as they are, they were occasionally blown offshore by inclement weather, allowing Jacobite ships to land their cargoes at these two ports. Now the British government were not particularly pleased about all this of course and decided to uh, intensify their efforts to put a stop to it. And so they asked this chap or they ordered this chap to uh, put a stop to the Jacobite activity if he possibly could. He was Rear Admiral John Bing. He was the commander of Leith Station. Um, he had a number of ships under his command and one of them was the Sloop Hazard, which was captained by a chap called Thomas Hill. And Bing ordered Captain Hill 
to enter Montrose Harbour and destroy the French ships which were reputedly docked there. And for good measure, being said, if there are any other ships in the harbour, destroy the rigging of those ships as well, just belt and braces really, just in case they were sympathetic to the Jacobite cause. I just have a little aside about John Bing, interesting chap. He met a sticky end, unfortunately. He was uh, court-martialed and executed by firing squad in 1757 uh, at the age of 52. And his, uh, his crime or his alleged crime or his failure um, was failing to prevent the island of Minorca falling to the French during the Seven Years' War, which took place between 1756 and 1763. So he was an enemy of the Jacobites, but he, he, came, he came to a sticky end, uh, nonetheless, in the service uh, of the Royal Navy. So let's have a look at the hazard itself. Uh, as I mentioned, she was a sloop, Merlin-class sloop, built at Rotherhide on the Thames, fitted out at Deptford, launched on the 11th of December, 1744. Uh, she is a sloop of 270 tons, 110 men, armed with 14 six-pounder guns, and as we've heard, captained by Thomas Hill. And you can see a picture of her there, and underneath it says, the, the caption on the picture says, Le Prince Charles X Hazard, and we'll get to that in a little while. Now the Hazard, once she'd entered Montrose Harbour, found that the French ships were gone, or possibly had never been there at all, or not recently. Anyway, there were no French ships there. But the activity in the harbour attracted the attention of a gentleman called David Ferrier. He was the Jacobite governor of Brechin. And on a couple of nights between the 20th and 22nd of November, 1745, <coughs> me, Ferrier's men exchanged shots with the hazard, which was confined to harbour by easterly winds. Excuse me. This was a bit of a standoff. Ferrier didn't have enough men to capture the hazard and the hazard's men didn't really want to risk leaving the ship and confronting uh, Ferrier's men either. But the deadlock, this was a bit of a deadlock, but it was broken um, on the 23rd of November uh, when the French ship La Ronnamé hove into view. She was part of a flotilla of two frigates and six smaller vessels which had sailed from Dunkirk on the 14th of November but had been scattered by the same storms that had dispersed Bing's blockading squadrons. The captain of La, La Renommée at first mistook the hazard for a French ship and he made straight for the harbour. But he didn't know the waters very well, probably didn't have adequate charts or maybe no charts at all. So he ran aground almost immediately on the south bank of the channel in Montreal's harbour. The hazard opened fire um, but desisted after La Ronamé ran up British colours. Um, in the confusion, 150 men of the Royal Écossais and 12 assorted cannon were brought ashore. And by the 25th of November, the French um, had used the cannon to construct a couple of batteries on the south side of the harbour and successfully bombarded Hazard into a state of serious disrepair. Captain Hill sent one of his lieutenants, Lieutenant Burgess, ashore to negotiate with the French. And he was shown a stove being used to heat cannonballs up red hot, ready to be fired at the hazard. So he returned to the ship with that news and the hazard promptly surrendered. And we just have a, a little map, courtesy of Dr. Christopher Duffy of uh, Montrose Harbour in 1745. You can see it's quite a big harbour, narrow entrance. Uh, you can see the channel through the basin there. Uh, at high tide, it was perfectly adequate for any number of ships, but at low tide, or with a receding tide, um, there's a lot of sandbanks and um, just a narrow channel of deeper water. And this is where um, La Ronamé uh, grounded herself. A little aside about La Ronamé as well. Um, she eventually escaped from Montrose Harbour and went on to have a career in the French Navy during the War of Austrian Succession. And she was eventually captured by HMS Dover in 1747 and named the Renown. So here we are back at the hazard again. 
Asa was made seaworthy by the French and sailed to France to be refitted and renamed Le Prince Charles and put into use for the Jacobite cause. So I'm just going to mention the Battle of Falkirk on the 17th of January 1746, because after this battle, Prince Charles pleaded with King Louis XV for more help. And Antoine Walsh, whose name you will be familiar with from his involvement of the Duté, which brought Prince Charles to Scotland in the first instance, Antoine Walsh had secured £13,000 in gold coin, as well as a thousand pistols, pistols and swords. And after loading the passengers and the cargo on Le Prince Charles, it set sail for Scotland under the command of Captain Richard Talbot, who was an Irishman, Jacobite sympathizer, obviously, who had lived in Brest for 11 years. Now, the Prince Charles intended to make for one of these two ports, which are uh, marked with the blue arrows. Here you can see uh, a map of um, northeast of Scotland, not quite as far north as um, uh, the Kyle of Tongue, because the Inverness on the left hand side there and the Merry Firth, and the two blue arrows are pointing to Findhorn and Portsoy. These two ports were in Jacobite hands. Uh, they were quite small ports. They were adequate to berth a sloop the size of uh, the Hazard or Le Prince Charles, but not uh, deep enough, not big enough uh, to allow a pursuing British warship uh, into the ports to, to get at them. The Royal Navy was aware of what the Jacobites uh, probably intended, and so they stationed uh, four ships um, off Troop Head. Troop Head is um, uh, just off Fraserburgh, the, uh, the, the, the eastern corner of the land there. Uh, you can see the British ships are, are marked with the black ship and the, and the letters HMS. And these ships were the 49-gun Eltham and the 24-gun Sheerness and a couple of sloops similar to the, uh, the Hazard Prince Charles, uh, the Hawk and Hound. On the 24th of March, the captain um, of the Sheerness, a chap called Lucius O'Brien, spotted the enemy sail uh, and the British government's ships gave chase forcing Le Prince Charles uh, to abandon its attempt to um, uh, enter the ports of either Portsoy or Findhorn and force them north. And again, you can see uh, another little ship, an outline of a ship and a blue arrow pointing due north and the words Le Prince Charles. Uh, that's where uh, the direction they took. The Jacobite ship managed to maintain the distance between itself uh, and the pursuing British uh, warships. Uh, it got dark at night, of course, uh, and O'Brien lost contact with his quarry at about 10 o'clock at night. But the next morning, after the mist had cleared, Le Prince Charles was once again within sight, uh, and Captain Talbot uh, took a gamble to try and escape. Uh, by this time, he'd gone quite a long way north, and so he, uh, uh, tried to, he, tried, sailed, he sailed due west through the notoriously difficult Pentland Firth between the Orkney Islands and the mainland. The coast was not well mapped, and again, probably he didn't have adequate charts. Uh, Talbot was desperate to escape the closing Sheerness and he steered his ship into the nearest inlet, which was the Kyle of Tum. So here we are at the headland of Ard Skinnard at the entrance to the Kyle of Tum. Uh, and this Captain Talbot um, steered his ship into the Kyle and immediately grounded himself on a sandbank below this headland on the western side of the Kyle. There we have a photograph of Ard Skinnard head, headland uh, and a little useful signpost pointing us to Skinnard Beach and Ard. Um, Captain O'Brien of the Sheerness was reluctant to follow Le Prince Charles too closely as he could see that the French ship had grounded. So he anchored his ship about 300 yards away and opened fire with Le Prince Charles well within range of his cannon. By early evening, many of the crew of the Prince Charles had been killed or were wounded, and they were calling upon Captain Talbot to surrender. Deciding that his ship was lost, Talbot decided to cut his cables, and on the rising tide, Le Prince Charles floated off the sandbank and foundered on the rocks. The Sheerness used the deeper water to close on her enemy, and at 150 yards fired three more broadsides. The Jacobite vessel was very badly damaged, both below and above the waterline. Undeterred, 
well, probably slightly deterred, but undefeated. Um, and under the cover of darkness, Captain Talbot and his men were able to remove the chests of gold, but not those filled with pistols and other armaments. Nor could they take off the barrels of gunpowder. And Talbot could not bring himself to set fire to the ship as there were wounded men on board. When Lieutenant Allen of the Sheerness took possession of Le Prince Charles, the ship was deserted, apart from the wounded and three civilian Highlanders who had come aboard looking for whatever they could find. A hawser was attached and the Prince Charles was patched up as best as, pos best as possible and eventually brought to Aberdeen where she was repaired and recommissioned into the Royal Navy. So let's have a look at what Captain Talbot and his men did after they left their ship. Um, they started walking down the western side of, of the Kyle with the chests of gold. Um, they got away, but they knew that they were in Mackay country, an area where George Mackay, Lord Ray, was the government supporting clan chief. However, they were fortunate enough to find themselves close to Melness House, um, which was occupied by William Mackay, one of the few Jacobite um, sympathisers in the area. And I've marked on the map there Ard Skinnard, that's the top blue arrow where Le Prince Charles founded. Um, then there's Melness House, where William Mackay lived and Tongue House where George Mackay uh, occupied that particular building. And the line down the western side of the Kyle is the route that the uh, Jacobite men took. Uh, William Mackay was quite good to them. He sold them, he didn't give them, but he sold them a couple of horses and instructed his two sons to guide the party out of hostile territory. And the idea was that they were going to carry this gold and themselves and whatever equipment they could manage to take with them, the 80 miles across country to the east coast, where the Earl of Cromarty could be expected to provide a safe haven. I mean, that's a big ask at any time, uh, carrying chests of gold 80 miles um, in hostile territory with uh, inadequate supplies of food or inadequate supplies of everything, probably. But in any event, it didn't really matter because they got nowhere near their destination. Unfortunately for Talbot's men, a previous Jacobite success had led in part to their downfall. The Jacobites had successfully scattered the Hanoverian forces of the Earl of Loudoun in an operation over the Dornoch Firth on the 20th of March. And many of the Hanoverians who were not captured reassembled in the village of Tongue under the protection of Lord Ray of Tongue House and so were readily available to give chase to the fugitives. The officers of the 64 Highlanders gathered together as many men as they could and with the Mackay militia crossed the, uh, the Kyle, crossed the water um, and pursued Talbot's part party as it struggled along the inhospitable ground of the western side of the Kyle. So the Jacobites luck ran, luck ran off close to Loch and Hakoin, which is marked on the map as well. Not entirely sure that that's the correct pronunciation of it. Um, it might be produced Lochen Ach Ken um, in Gaelic. But anyway, when they got there, they were surrounded by approximately 320 men, all of whom were antagonistic towards them. The best they could do was to hurriedly throw much of the gold into the loch or into the heather, after which they surrendered. There now became a frantic search for the, the coins and most of the gold was retrieved and distributed by Lord Ray, who awarded himself generously 500 guineas and his two sons even more generously 700 pounds each. The regular soldiers of the 64th received about eight pounds each. So some 156 men of all ranks were captured and taken to Aberdeen. And there's a list available from the London Gazette of April the 12th to 15th, 1746. And this is the London Gazette of that date. Uh, I'm not going to read you out the names of all the people that are mentioned on it, but I will read you out relevant details that were printed in, the, uh, in this newspaper of this date. Um, news to drop onto the breakfast tables of those that could afford to buy newspapers. Um, and interesting news it would have been and interesting news it is today. So here we are, the London Gazette, April the 12th to April the 15th, 1746. An express arrived on Sunday last from His Royal Highness, the Duke of Cumberland. Aberdeen, April 6th. 
His Royal Highness the Duke of Cumberland will begin his march tomorrow towards Inverness, where he proposes to be on the 17th instant. All the intelligence we have had for these two days past about the rebels has only been a confirmation of their confusion and mutinies, and we hear that they desert from all parts. Captain Mackay, Lord Ray's son, and Sir Henry Munro, both captains in Lord Loudon's regiment, are just come hither with letters from Captain O'Brien of the Sheerness Man of War, now off this place, giving an account that after chasing the hazard sloop, he drove her ashore and obliged the French and Spaniards who were in her to land, which they did, with five chests of money to the value of £12,000 and upwards, in order to join the rebels. But the Lord Ray, in whose country they were landed and at whose house Captain Mackay, with some other officers of Lord Loudon's regiment, were, with about 80 men of the same regiment, who had been driven thither by the rebels, marched out and attacked them. And after killing three or four and dangerously wounding eight, took the remaining 156 officers, soldiers and sailors prisoner, who were immediately embarked on board the Sheerness, and the prize with the Highland officers and men who made this capture are now here. Captain O'Brien took possession of the said sloop. He found on board her 14 chests of pistols and sabres with 13 barrels of powder designed for the use of the rebels. The prisoners on board the Sheerness are ordered to be sent to Berwick. The money which was landed out of the hazard sloop was taken by Lord Ray's men. So that's an interesting article in the London Gazette. Now, to try and um, ameliorate this situation, a strong force of Jacobites under the command of Lord Cromarty and the infamous Colban MacDonald of Barisdale were dispatched in order to recover the gold. But by the time they got there, it was too late. Instead of returning south to Prince Charles in Inverness, they remained in the north, exacting revenge on old enemies. And as they said, they were raising contributions, in inverted commas, for the Jacobite cause. The Whig militia were becoming more confident and Cromarty's men fell back on Dunrobin Castle, where the officers were taken prisoner on April the 15th. So, this story is interesting enough as it is, but speculation about the consequences is a useful exercise, perhaps. The Jacobite army was in Inverness at the time of the Kyle of Tongue incident, and Prince Charles was finding it increasingly difficult to feed, pay, and house his army. The gold under Prince Charles was badly needed, and had it been available, it's possible that the desperate march to Cumberland's camp at Nairn the night before the Battle of Culloden might not have taken place and the Jacobite army would certainly have been in a much better state to fight the impending battle. And we have a, a quotation here from John William O'Sullivan's narrative, which is reproduced in Alistair and Henrietta Taylor, Taylor's book, 1745 and after. And O'Sullivan writes, how could you keep nine or 10,000 men together without meal or money? There was none to be had in the mountains. You could not get them cows without money. You could not keep them out in the fields in the season we were in they must be quartered in villages. And there's another uh, telling uh, little uh, piece of writing uh, by James Maxwell of Kirkconnell, James Maxwell of Kirkconnell. He wrote the narrative of Charles, Prince of Wales expedition into Scotland in the year 1745. Uh, Maxwell was born in 1708 and he joined Prince Charles in Edinburgh and he was a captain uh, in the horse guards under uh, Lord Elko. And he writes in his narrative, the loss of this money was inexpressible. The prince's affairs had never been, had never had so bad an aspect. This last misfortune soon took air, notwithstanding all the care that was taken to conceal it, and disheartened the army. The soldiers began to murmur afresh and some of them deserted, though I must do them the justice to say that they only went home to live frugally upon what they had there, while the prince had no money to give them and they saw no pressing occasion for their attendance, and were resolved to join their colours as soon as there were any appearance of any action. I speak of the generality of those that retired about this time, who upon the first news they heard of the enemies advancing, set out of their own accord and made what haste they could to join the army, though few of them arrived in time. The prince was never so much at a loss what resolution to take. His affairs were very bad and could not fail to grow worse and worse every day 
unless he got some supply of money. So that's what Maxwell of Kirkconnell thinks. And I think he's pretty, pretty accurate there. Perhaps another factor to be taken into consideration that uh, Cromarty's forces, which had been sent, sent up north to try and retrieve the gold, if they'd not been in the north, they would have been available to fight at Culloden. Although in mitigation of their behavior, once in the north, they could, have, could not have been sure when the Battle of Culloden would take place. So would the arrival of the gold into the Jacobite camp at Inverness have changed the outcome of the battle or the Jacobite campaign? We'll never know, probably, uh, but it's undoubtedly true that it would have given the, both the prince and his men a boost of confidence for the trials ahead. So, a few words now. That's about it for the story of the, the incident, but I'm going to give you a few words now about the plaque itself. The initial idea uh, was that, um, of, that of Christopher Duffy, Dr. Christopher Duffy. He thought it'd be quite a, quite a thing to uh, erect a monument in this area uh, to commemorate this particular incident. So, in uh, 2016, a long time ago now, uh, Christopher Duffy and Peter Lowell and myself uh, went up to Tongue um, to see, to investigate the possibility of raising some sort of monument. And here we have a picture of Christopher on the right there and uh, Peter Lowell, the late Peter Lowell, he's unfortunately passed away uh, on the left of the screen. Not sure either of these two gentlemen are particularly well dressed for the terrain, wearing just ordinary shoes and both of them wearing ties. I am behind the camera. I think I was probably dressed a little more casually, but I was probably not uh, very well equipped for this terrain. As you can see, it's um, we're near Ard Skinner at the time and we're looking for a suitable place um, to build a, a cairn at the time. That was the idea, we might build a cairn. You can see that the ground is very waterlogged, very difficult to traverse. And eventually, um, because we thought that building a cairn would be quite, um, quite difficult, it would need supervision whilst it was being built, maintenance afterwards, and it's in a very remote area, of course, so we decided against the cairn and we decided in favour of the plaque. So we approached uh, Kate Mackay, who was the proprietor of the Craggan Hotel in Melness, for permission to erect a plaque on the side of her hotel. Uh, she willingly gave permission. And so that's where the plaque is now. And so we'll finish the talk by another view of this um, remarkable uh, plaque, which we erected in 2019, it took us three years on and off to um, to get round to doing it with various discussions and difficulties and planning permissions and one thing and another. Uh, but in the end, it was erected and there it is. Um, I have not actually been to see it yet. Uh, COVID-19 has put a stop to all that sort of traveling. We did have a uh, an idea that we'd mount a sort of 1745 expedition up to see it and formally unveil it. Uh, but to date, that has not been possible. So we, we hope for better things in the future. So thank you very much for attending, for listening and watching this talk. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask questions or make comments.